the Lord told me that there would be a pandemic that, that, that came, but the first one would prove to be little but fear, but the second one that comes would be serious. So there's a pandemic that is going to be coming. And you're going to start seeing Russia take on a whole new nationalism, and Russia is going to create a crisis in order to... to Welcome back to another video. My name is Philip Paul. I've got some serious bedhead right now, but I don't care because I'm here to serve you an awesome meal. If you haven't watched my most recent video, What God Told Me About the Upcoming Shakings, I allude to this sermon that the Holy Spirit brought to my mind over the last couple of weeks, an old message that I heard John Paul Jackson give uh, having to do with the events that we're kind of living in right now and are going to live through in the years to come. So I've compiled this video for you. I've spliced it, edited it. There's so many empty spaces in it that I've removed. I hope you enjoy this. It's not necessarily a chronological timeline like I think I had, I think that was the word that I used, but more so it actually describes, um, as Jesus says, that we're going to enter into a time of wars and rumors of wars. Nations will rise against nations. He says in Matthew 24, there will be famines and earthquakes, but all of these are just birthing pains. Now, John Paul Jackson, he passed away in 2015, and for the last few years of his life, this was his final message to the nations, that they need to prepare for the perfect storm. This is what the Lord called it. This is what he called it. And he said, this is what the nations will call it as this perfect storm plays out, which we are currently in. So enjoy this video, and I hope it's beneficial. One last thing that I'll say is in this message, he jumps around a lot. He prophesies quite a bit, but then he teaches quite a bit, but then he continues to prophesy quite a bit. And it's all effective, but you need to watch the video in its entirety. So I would encourage you, if you feel like he's done with the prophecies, just wait a little bit longer because he continues. So let's go. I was, uh, I was all set with the sermon. Then I got a text from Matt this morning asking me to talk about a certain subject. <laughs> Um, before I do, I need to, I need to say something uh, in honor of my father. Um, the night before I, I left, I came here yesterday, and the night before, my father passed away. And, um, and so I, I come with a little, a little heavy heart. At the same time, it wasn't totally unexpected. I mean, he's been growing more feeble over, the, over time. He stayed, lived with us. He and my mother lived with us for um, the last... Uh, for about a year and a half or so, and then and then uh, my mother passed away in August, and my father passed away. So I fly back home this afternoon to uh, or right after right after this morning's meeting, uh, and we will bury him tomorrow morning. But uh, my father was an amazing man. I just need to share this because it helps you understand my composition because I have a DNA from this incredible man that uh, was my father. He was 85 years old when he passed away. My father was a was born in, in the, what they call the Panhandle of Texas. It's North Texas, and it, in, in Hereford, Texas. And there's a lot of wind up there, and it gets it's high plains, and so it gets very cold in the win <clears throat> Excuse me, in the winter. He was born to as the son of a sharecropper. My great grand, uh, my grandfather Jackson was a sharecropper. He he farmed land for other people, and he tended that land, but they were very very poor. So my father was raised in a, a little uh, two-room two house uh, that was actually a converted chicken coop. And they, they would wallpaper the walls with cardboard in order to keep the winter wind from coming through the, the board, uh, the, the flat boards that were on the siding of the chicken coop. My father was a very brilliant man, had a very high IQ. He skipped two grades in school, entered into college very early. He where he met my mother, he uh, achieved two master's degrees and was one dissertation short of two doctorate degrees and a specialist degree. But uh, he wanted to be a missionary. He and my mom wanted to be missionaries. But when they realized, they went through all the training and ready to go. We were ready to go to Nigeria. And the denomination that we were a part of instituted a, a, a law, or not a law, but a policy and the policy said that missionaries that have children have to leave their children in children's homes and go to the mission field. And so my mother and father decided not to be missionaries to Nigeria, but Nigeria continued to whisper in their ears, and they constantly had a passion for missions from that. 
My father became a teacher. He, he graduated, was going to be a pastor, but in the middle of his sermons, he would have blank spots, and so he would just stop, and he could not remember what to say. I suspect it was the Holy Spirit moving on him, and he didn't understand it, even then. Because of his brilliance, he, he, I mean, he had his sermons memorized. But uh, he became a teacher, and in that he began to counsel people, and he began to t touch people. And we were in church three or four times a week. And so we, us kids would be outside playing, shooting baskets or something on the church parking lot, and, and Dad would be inside counseling people. And, and I, I told people for years, my dad makes people cry. I didn't understand why everybody who left had tears in their eyes, their faces were red, and had Kleenex in their hands. And so I would ask my dad, why, why, would that, why does that happen? And he said, well, son, when the Lord touches people, sometimes that just happens. And deep inside my little boy's heart, I said, well, God may have touched him, but he used my dad to do it. My dad was, grew to be a very, he was a very man that deeply loved and loved people loved people coming to their house. Even as he got older and he had macular degeneration in his eyes and he couldn't see, he, his knees began to give out, he lost, began to lose his balance, and he would periodically, more than once, forget that he left something on the stove cooking. But he, he loved people and people loved him from the man who mowed his lawn, who was ready to commit suicide until he met my dad to the nurse that took care of him, to the hospice people who helped him in his last couple of months, to the nurses who came by to check on his blood pressure. Every one of them loved my dad. He led people to the Lord just in the last few, I mean, his whole life he led people to the Lord. And even the last few months when he couldn't walk, he couldn't see, he had trouble remembering the Bible verses and the Greek and Hebrew that he had so carefully memorized over the years, he still led people to the Lord from his hospital bed. People got saved. People got saved. They would come to the house, and they wanted two weeks before he passed away, a couple that was meals on wheels, and he wanted meals on wheels because it gave him more opportunity to talk to people about Jesus. The Meals on Wheels people was a, a backslidden Lutheran pastor who gave, rededicated his life to the Lord, he and his wife, and are now and wanted to start a Bible study with my dad two weeks before my dad passed away. I look at I look at my dad and I realize what a great man he was. And every anything that God has called me to be is because he and my mother planted something in me. Amen. Now, what do I say to that? I think, it's, I think it's very important that we honor our mother and father. Amen. It doesn't mean you agree with them. And it doesn't mean they're perfect. But there is an honor. And what God has put into me, I would not be there without my dad. The discipline he gave me, I was a wild child. I was wild. I mean, I, I, he, I got spankings 11 times in one day for just one thing, going across the street. I would not stop running across the street to play with my friend. 11 times I got spanking that day. 11 for one thing. And it's not because he spanked me 11 times because I did it once. It's because I did it 11 times. Always was a rebellious child, always was a strong-willed child, always was running against the grain of the family. My brothers and sisters were all compliant. I, as the oldest, was never compliant. But God worked through that, and God used my father to hone me and to prepare me. I would not be able to do what I do today nor say what I say today had it not been for the discipline of my father. So I honor him before you. And we will bury him tomorrow morning. And uh, while I will miss him, heaven is better off.
Thank you. <clears throat> I, met, uh, I met Julie Myers in 1985. <laughs> she was just barely out of diapers. <laughs> and um, so we've, we've known each other a long time. We just recently reconnected again for, uh, over a number of years. But when I, I came to Kansas City to be with Mike, Mike Bickle, for five or so years, a little more, <clears throat> I, uh, I had something happen to me. And I didn't, I didn't exactly know what to do with this, this something. I was in a corporate business world, and I had my life all mapped out. I was going to have a big house, and I would, I would drive my wife through rich neighborhoods, you know, like million-dollar homes, and, and say, honey, pick out the house you want. In 10 years, it's yours. I had my life mapped out. <clears throat> knew what I was going to be, knew what I was going to do, but I had no clue what God wanted me to do. I didn't even consider him except in believing that whatever I wanted, he wanted. Now, probably none of you are like that. <laughs> you never just kind of assume, well, if I want it, God wants it. He said he's going to give me the desires of my heart, and this is my desire. <laughs> so, well, that was, that was me. <clears throat> and, but I had... I had an encounter, and in this encounter, I was laying in bed one morning. I was, I was, I was in the top 100 of a Fortune 500 company. I had, as a 30-year-old, I had a key to the executive club on the top floor of the building. I was the youngest person to ever have a key to that club. I would go up there, and all these really old guys, you know, 50, 60-year-olds. <laughs> I call those children now. But all those really old guys were up there, and they would look at me like, what's this pup doing up here? And I would just show my key. <laughs> well, I was laying in bed one morning. We had a side business, a daycare center. We had 100 children that would come in and out of our daycare center every day. I would used to go to the daycare center with my wife, and we would open up. I would hug the kids, and I would go to work, and she would be left there with all the children and the teachers. This day, I couldn't talk. I woke up. I, I couldn't eat. I couldn't get out a whisper. Nothing would come out. I was just like, <clears throat> realizing that I would have to be on the phone all day at work and then not wanting to pass anything on to the children. I stayed in bed that morning. My wife left to go to, to, go to the daycare center. It was November the 11th, 1980, and it was dark. Somewhere in the dark after my wife left. I'm laying in bed, and I realize there's a light in the room, and I think I must have left the light on. I start to get up to turn the light off, and I realize that that light is not coming from the light bulb in the ceiling. <clears throat> Very soon, in just a few minutes, that light begins to expand. It takes up the entire room. Everything disappears in the room. The chest of drawers disappear. The mirror disappears. The lamps disappear. Everything disappears. I'm left in the presence of, holy, of a holy God, I roll out of bed onto the floor because the bed is too high in the presence of this holiness. At that particular time, I, I begin to review my life with me. He plays my life back with me from the time that my mother was carrying me and the miracle that it was that I was even born because she carried me for 11 months to the day, documented it. And that 11-month pregnancy was to be a sign that the angel announced to her before she even conceived me that I would have an 11th hour ministry and I would tell things that are not as though they were and they would come to pass and that even her pregnancy would be a sign of my 11th hour ministry. She could have chose a lot of different ways to have it a sign, but that was a particular sign God gave. And he showed me that right, why right after I was born, six weeks after I was born, I died because I ended up having a rupture. My, my, I broke three of her ribs in a birth and my intestines ruptured. And so for six weeks, part of everything that I ate entered into my abdominal cavity and gangrene set in. They thought I was a colicky baby, but I wasn't a colicky baby. They began to notice that gangrene was there because they saw it through the skin. 
They took me to the doctor. The doctor opens me up. He realizes that I'm in, I'm in trouble. They or looks at me. They immediately put me into an operating room. They operate up on me. I die on the operating table. And my mother cries out to God, God, you promised my son would have an 11th hour minutes. He would preach the gospel. And he has not done that. You are not a liar. You are God. You must yes. bring him back. And God brought me back. <clears throat> He showed, he showed me prior to that birth, he showed me my mother drinking bottles of castor oil, which I never knew until I asked her if that was true, trying to induce the uterine, uterus into contractions. I saw her sitting at the top of a stairway, bouncing down on her rear end, down the stairs, trying to induce this baby to come. None of that worked. She told me it was a sign of my stubbornness from the very beginning. As I, begin to, as I begin to continue to grow, the Lord began to move upon me and I began to know things before they happened. When I was four years old, I told mom and dad things that would happen and they, they took place. As I was six and seven years old, I would tell them who was going to come to the door that day. Somebody who had quit the business, the delivery man that, was, that had left to go to another company. All those things came true. I did not know that I had a gift. I just thought everybody had, everybody could do this. When I'm 14, 12, 10, I'm... I, Children come into our house. I visit my grandparents, and and before the before the time that we were over, it seemed like every time it we it ended up, John Paul is in the yard, and the kids are gathered around him, and we're all playing something called "Let's Let John Paul Tell Us About Ourselves." <laughs> and I thought, okay, everybody can do this. They don't want to do it. I guess I'll do it. So here we go. I'll do it. So he begins to review these things with me, reviews how when I was 12 years old, I came home with mumps and encephalitis and how my body temperature went up to 104 degrees for three weeks and I was quarantined, how then at, after three weeks it went up even worse and I began to hallucinate and uh, the doctor came and, and checked me out and I had encephalitis and the mumps simultaneously and what ends up happening is your temperature escalates and the lining of your brain swells and you end up going to sleep and dying. For three days, they packed me in a tube of ice because my temperature reached clear to the end of the thermometer, which is over 107 degrees. The doctor on the medical report put down 110 degrees plus, and that all of us 40 years of being a doctor had never seen anything like this. He began to prepare my mother and father for me to die. He said it would be better if I died because I'll never know them again. Your son is brain dead. His heart is still beating. He's still breathing, but he's, he's brain dead. And they said he'll never know he'll never know you again. He'll never he'll never be able to speak again. He's going to have heart trouble. He's going to have kidney trouble. He's going to have liver trouble. And he will die at an early age. And he'll have diapers. And you're going to have to change him. And you're, this this is your son. And it's really better if he dies. On the third day that happened, I died. My mother, my father, my pastor, my my uh, doctor was in the room. Uh, my parents were crying. My pastor was trying to comfort them. I had died. I left my body. I was going up into the light. I looked behind me, and the light was blinding. I looked back down at my body in the bed. It was like a picture window, and the further I got away, the smaller the window got. As I'm looking at myself, I hear my mother crying out, and she's saying the same thing again. She's saying, God, you said, my son, you are not a liar. You must honor your word. You must bring him back. And I, I was there. For about 45 minutes, I came back down. By the time I got to the roof, I, I entered myself again, and I realized I was freezing because of this ice that I was packed in. <laughs> and so I said, hey, I'm cold. Get me out of here. The doctor was so shocked. He's just like stuttering. <laughs> and he begins to ask me, what's 1 plus 1? I, you know, 2 plus 2, 5 plus 7, 20 minus 13. What's... What's your phone number? What's your name? It's like trying to find out if I had any intelligence left. What ended up happening, they gave me an intelligence test later. My IQ went up by 20 points. Yeah. And I needed that. The Lord begins to review all these things with me. He begins to review how, and he says, here's some things you don't know. Here's some, and, and I asked my mother about the pre the pre-delivery uh, pre things, and she said, how did you know? I've never told you that. I said, I saw you doing it. 
She begins to, uh, the doctor, uh, I mean, sorry, the, the Lord begins to review to me all the times he saved my life. He said, this is nothing. He said, there's so many times I saved your life. And he said, and I save all of my children's life like this every day and they don't know it. He said, he said, watch this. And he showed me a time, he showed me multiple times when the car wouldn't start, the battery was dead, and I was hitting the steering wheel going, what in the world? You know, I'm like angry, this businessman who's got to go conquer the world. And had the car started, I would have been in an accident and killed in the accident. He showed me a time where I ran out of gas. I'm thinking, I couldn't have run out of gas. I had a half a tank like, like two miles ago. And, I, and now that it's on empty. And had... Had I not ran out of gas, I'd been in an accident and I would have been killed. He showed me where I actually was able to drive further on gasoline than I had in the car. Because had I stopped, I would have been a high, I would have been robbed on the highway and beaten and killed. He says, I do this for my children all the time and they don't know it. And he was letting me know, you're not special. It was like, it was like, as my father had the chicken coop, I had this. My father never fought the chicken coop, never forgot the chicken coop he came from. I never forgot this moment where God says, you're not special. It's just a function in the kingdom, son. It's no more valuable than, than parking lot detail. It's no more valuable than the children's ministry. It's no more valuable than worship. It's, it's something that allows the kingdom to function. So, so you're not special. And the Lord began to, to move on me. And, and, and so this morning as he's reviewing all of that with me, as I'm laying on the floor wailing and crying and sobbing, realizing how unholy I was and how holy he was, he begins to say, now this is what I'm going to do with you in the future. And he begins to show me and tell me, here's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to cause you to speak words that are going to be very, very difficult. I'm going to cause you to release things in a, very, in a time and people aren't going to want to hear what you have to say. But when you have the opportunity to say it, you must step forward and you must speak the things that I've called you to say. So I, but, so I ended up leaving the ministry, and long story, but I ended up leaving the, I'm leaving the corporate world and going into ministry. And I have, I have quit a thousand times and been thankful a million times. I'm so glad that God called me to do what he's called me to do, but there, there is pain. Solomon said, with much knowledge comes much sorrow. When I came to Kansas City in 1985 and started working with Mike Bickle at that particular time, I was really green, really, really green. I, I barely knew Dog from Sikkim. Uh, I fell off the turnip truck just the night before. You know, those are Waxahachie sayings if you didn't know what that means. Waxahachie saying, that's where I was born. Remember last night I was born in Waxahachie, Texas? So, um, I, was, I didn't know, I, I'd left the corporate world just a, a couple of years earlier. Uh, but God had moved up, up on me, and there was a connection there between Mike and myself, and something happened in very unusual ways. And I, I came into Kansas City with all these things about this is what's going to be happening in the United States of America. And, uh, and what he had shown me some things. And then as time began to grow, God began to say, I need to broaden what I've called you to do. And, and I, I started into more personal prophetic ministry versus national prophetic ministry. And as I started this national prophet, I started doing this personal prophetic ministry, then that ended up with John Wimber coming to Kansas City and asking Mike if, if he could take me and take me to California and teach me theology and bibliology and historiology and so on. And, and so Mike agreed and I went to California and stayed with John Wimber for a number of years. And, and then the Lord decided the next thing I need to do is learn how to be more patient and more kind and more gentle. And then he sent me through tribulation called being a pastor. Because <laughs> tribulation works patience. So I ended up becoming a pa uh, planting my first church in Moline, Illinois, and have planted six churches since then, pastored two other churches, and been on staff at three other churches with uh, 
very large churches with Larry Lee, with Mike Bickle, and with, with John Wimber. And now, in the latter years of my ministry, I, don't, I think I'm going to live a lot more years, but at, at 60, 62 years of age, you're not particularly thinking, what world can I conquer now? You're looking at guys like Matt and saying, hey, go conquer that world. You're thinking about how do I handle and how do I leave a legacy? Where are, are the young men and women that are going to be champions in the next move? And how are they going to, how, how, what are they going to be doing and what are they going to be doing? And how can I help them get to where God's called them to be? But for some reason, all of a sudden, in 19, and I'm sorry, in 2007, the Lord said to me, I want you to start talking about national and international events again. And I thought, whoa, 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 time out. I'm patient. I'm a pastor. <laughs> and he says, no, you've never been a good pastor. <laughs> you are more patient, but you still have a lot of work to do. He says, I, I want you to become what I birthed you to become. And he began to renew the things that he had talked to me about in the nation and began to show me more things concerning this nation. And he said, this is the time for which you were born. You're about, this nation and the world is about to head into this era that I told your mother about. Your 11th hour ministry has begun. And so he began to tell me about things that were going to be happening very, very quickly. He said, you need to prepare yourself. You need to start talking about this. You need to start preparing the people. There's, there's a storm coming. It's a, it's a terrible storm. It's, and he called it a perfect storm. And he says, I'm going to use this term. He said, but you're going to hear it used a lot in the, in the coming years. They're going to hear this term a lot. They're going to be there's the perfect storm. It's a perfect storm of a blend of these economic conditions. It's a perfect storm of a blend of these climatological conditions. It's a perfect storm of these, of these political conditions. You're going to hear this a lot, but I'm telling you, do it now. I argued for a year. And early in 2008, I said, okay, Lord, I will do this. And we, we put out this message called the coming perfect storm. It's and here's what the Lord said. He said, there are five elements that the storm is comprised of. Those five elements are religion, politics, economics, war, and geophysical events. He said, these are the things that the prophets of old spoke of. These are the things I want you to speak of. There are political changes coming. There are religious wars and shifts going to be happening. There are, there are economic uh, downturns that are going to be taking place. There are things that are going to be happening climatologically, and you need to be able to speak and tell people this is, what, this is what's coming. He said, my church has forgotten that I still am a God of, of justice, and I still bring judgment to my people to redeem them. And if I do not allow judgment to come, or if I do not allow these crises to come, then, then uh, my wrath will have to come. And I'm going to allow my judgments to come in order for, in order for redemption of my people so they will cry out to me. And in the day that they cry out to me, I will be found again. And so I know that we are headed towards a great move of God. It's what will it take to get us there that I'm concerned about. I know that our best days lie ahead of us. It's what will it take to get us there. That's what I'm concerned about. You see, when God begins to, sin separates us from God. And it, it, when, it, from the very beginning, if this is us and this is God's hand, from the very beginning, as, as the more we sin, God's hand lifts. And the more God's hand lifts, the more room the enemy has to get in. And that's what's taking, that's what's taking place. The enemy has a lot of room to get into our nation and this world right now. The, the spiritual water tables are, are at a low ebb. And from the spiritual water table, you have spiritual leaders or you have political leaders that arise. And the political leaders arise only a certain amount. Let's just say 10% above the water table will be a spiritual leader. And if the water table is low, then it's 10% above the low. If the water table is high, it's 10% above the high. And right now, we're at a low ebb. We're in a drought. And so... We, we find that 
that our politicians who say they love God and so on uh, misquote the Bible. I mean, so we're not talking like hard verses, like obscure verses here. We're talking, we're talking like John three sixteen. They can't even quote it. So we find out that that what is going on there's a decay that takes place. From the very beginning, decay has been the result of a lack of closeness with God. In Him is all of our life. The further away from Him we are, the less life we have. The further away from God we are, the less brilliance we have. We don't think of things that we used to think of. We don't notice the things we should have noticed. We don't feel the things we should have felt. We don't sense the things we should have sensed. And we make decisions from that muted feeling, thinking, sensing, seeing. And we wonder why we make wrong decisions. Then our political leaders make those same wrong decisions. The problem is that our decision may cost us 50 cents or, or $10, their decision costs us a trillion. Amen. We have to be very, very careful in this day and age because we have forgotten that everything truly is dependent on God. We don't have above the line thinking as I talked about last night. We have below earthly thinking and sometimes subterranean thinking. And so what we're looking at is we're looking at a whole era, and this has nothing to do with the Republican or Democrat. This has to do with, with the heart of a people and a nation who, who do not know their God any longer. And the, 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 the depletion of absolutes so that, so that anything is like, every, the virgin birth used to be non-controvertible, but now it, is, now it is like, what do you mean a virgin birth? The issue of sin used to be non-controvertible, but now they go, well, I, I, what is it? I don't, you know, but grace covers my sin. I don't have to worry about sin. I was talking to, to a group of young leaders uh, not so long ago in these, uh, that are well-known in, in the nation. It wasn't the prophetic gathering that I had recently, but it was, a couple, it was actually about 18 months ago. And I was talking to them, and, and, I, and one of them said to me, I don't have to worry about sin. I can, I can, I can, I can literally have an adulterous affair, and I'll be back in the ministry in two months. And this attitude is beginning, to perme is beginning to permeate. And that's very concerning to me. And that's why I said last night, righteousness is seen as legalism because that's what they told me. And there's no such thing as holiness. That's a pre-covenant, pre-new covenant I idea. And so I am concerned. I'm concerned. And the, and the more that the more that sin separates us from God, the more the enemy comes in, and the enemy is coming in. And there are things that are going on right now that are going to be very, very devastating to us. So the Lord began to tell me in, in, about things in, in 2007. Began to show me things that were going to be happening, and the things like Egypt. He said, "Watch what's going to be happening in the Middle East." And here's a sign for you, Egypt. President Mubarak is going to be removed from office and Egypt will turn into a terrorist state. When that begins to happen, know that the rest of the Arab nations that do not uh, espouse uh, religious uh, extremism, uh, Islamic religious extremism, understand that they will be deposed under a false guise and a harsher regime will take each of their places, including Saudi Arabia. And it will begin, watch Egypt. I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. Egypt, I mean, that's not going to, uh, that's on nobody's radar screen. Come on. And then lo and behold, yes, yes. you know that, you know what's gone on in Egypt. And now just, just in the last week, the military has turned control of Egypt over to extreme Islamic factions. It is now, Mubarak will soon die. If he doesn't die from execution, he'll, he will die of cancer because he has, he has terminal cancer, stage four terminal cancer. He's got weeks of, uh, and at the most months, to, you know, a handful of months to live. So one way or the other, they're either going to execute him or, they're going, or, or he's going to die from the cancer. And it will become a terrorist state. When that begins to happen, you're going to start seeing dominoes happen. And so, and you have, you start Libya, boom. So, uh, Syria is happening right now. It, Yemen has been happening. It won't be long until you see, see the issue of Jordan and so on. And here's what, here's what happens. 
they come in, they allow the youth, the zeal of the youth, to think that they can garner democracy. But they don't have the infrastructure to sustain what they overthrow. And therefore, that which does have the, have the infrastructure allows the zeal of the youth to pay the price. And then they bring their infrastructure over the zeal of the youth and have a harsher regime in the end. And the extremism and the Islamic faith then begin to take over. And that's exactly what is taking place today. He said, begin to watch the European community. He said, because I'm going to trouble the waters in, in Europe and the euro is going to start to fall and, and it will weaken and it will crumble. Uh, and, I, and he said, and then shortly after that, your dollar will follow. And I'm going, oh my goodness, Lord. He said, my people are going to cry out to me. I said, when? And he says, it will keep getting darker until they do. It will keep getting darker until they do. In March, I was on Daystar TV, and the Lord had me, had me prophesy about a coming assassination attempt upon a congressman. Little did I know that in August of that year, that would happen with Gabby Gifford. So the only reason I'm saying these type of things, and I could, we could go down the list of things that I've said that have happened, and that's not me. I only repeat what I hear. I, I, I tell what I see because the Lord has, I feel like Amos and Jeremiah, the lion has roared, who can but speak? Yeah. And this is what I was born for. And yet at the same time, I feel like if I tell everything, Lord, I don't want people to lose hope. I want them to find hope in you. I want yeah. them to know you because if I tell everything that you've shown me, the people won't be able to take what you've shown me. They won't be able to handle what you've shown me. And so that's always a tension that, that the prophets of old, and, I'm not, I, and I, by the way, I, I never have called myself a prophet. I literally do not think I am a prophet. And here's why, because I have seen prophetic ministry of the future and what it's really going to be like, and I'm not there yet. And I know that, and I don't want to call myself a prophet today and then next, and then as, as, as I, or our prophets that are really even more gifted, then they say, well, I, you know, how do we describe ourselves? Well, I'm a most eminent prophet. I'm a prophet. I'm a most eminent prophet. I'm a prophet of the third kind. I'm intergalactic. So see, I don't, I don't want to go that route. Uh, I'd rather wait to call myself a prophet or whoever is a prophet until the, till the real prophetic people show up on the scene. But I'm doing what God has called me to do with what, with the tools and equipment that He's given me. And this, this Lord that we serve is mighty and able to save in every way. And at the time we call out to Him, if we sustain the call, I mean, it can't be like, oh, help me, oh God, thank you. And then we go back out and do what we used to do. There has to be a, a sustained, it's a sustained change is what God is looking for. It's not, it's like Jesus said, these people serve me with their lips, but the heart is far from me. We have to have a change of heart, not just a change of lip. And so I'm looking at, at what's, what's going to be coming. And even yesterday, the uh, several European nations were downgraded uh, in their economic condition. They, they're squawking about downgrading from from triple A to, to A, double A plus, they should have been downgraded to B minus. So should the United States. I mean, right now, what would happen to you if you make $50,000 a year and you have debt, a debt of $60,000 a year? What would happen to you? Well, that's where we're at right now in the United States. We owe more we, we owe more than we take in in GD, uh, uh, GN, GNP, gross national product, than right now. We, ha we owe more than we take in each year in gross national product. What does that say? It says, it says if we just paid interest only, we couldn't pay it. Somehow we've, we have become, uh, we've, we've come to the place where that we expect uh, something for nothing. Whether it's gambling on the state lottery. See, part of the part of the whole way of God is when you work, you multiply. 
and lottery systems aren't work. And that's that's the that's the error of lottery. Is that there's no work involved in the multiplying, and that's why the fruit of the recipients, of whether it be a million dollars a year for life, in publisher sweepstakes, or whether it be the lottery, or or any number of things. 95% of all those people 10 years later are bankrupt and or dead. Because the, the fruit of something for nothing is very short-lived. Very short-lived. You see, it's the work that you do that teaches you how to handle what you get. And we've come to a place where that we expect something for nothing, whether whether it's in government entitlements or whatever, we still expect something for nothing. And I'm, I'm not opposed to helping people that need help. In fact, I'm all for that. But it's a whole lot better to, as, as you know, the scripture says, teach a man how to fish than to give them the fish. And so what we have to do is there's, there's massive, massive changes that have to take place. The problem is when you have politicians that are leading, whether it's Republican or Democrat, when you have a politician that's leading, politicians want to get reelected. And so they'll do what the people want versus what the country needs. And because of because they don't have that that spiritual finance that I'm sorry, that spiritual backbone that says we have to do what's right. Because they come from a low spiritual water table. Then what happens is they make decisions that only prolong something till after their election process is over. And they retire. And we're seeing that all the time right now. Both in both sides, both parties. We're seeing that all the time right now. It's so it's so saddening to me because I realize that all it's doing is it's making things worse and that what the Lord showed me truly is going to going to come to pass. And if we do not cry out to God, at some point, our enemies will rule over us. There will come times when we, stadiums will be full, but it will be, it will be for a solemn assembly. There will come times when the stadiums are full because nobody can afford to pay the prices to go to a New York Giants game or a Jets game or a Patriots game or a Cowboys game or a Rams game. Nobody can afford to pay the price. And they'll be want, they'll, you, you have plenty of time to use the stadium. Things are going to be happening. Even this year, even this year, European issues are going to escalate. Even this year, tensions in Israel and Iran are going to escalate. The day is going to come when, Iran, when Israel will hit Iran. They already have hit. There were mystery explosions that happened. And the Lord told me about this. He said, Israel one day will one day send in uh, uh, rockets into Iran. He said, but before that day happens, there will be other explosions that are, will be called mystery explosions. And those have happened. But one day it is going to happen. And when that, when that takes place and those <clears throat> missiles hit Iran, you, there's going to be a huge growth of anti-Semitism. And everybody's going to blame Israel on the price of gasoline. You're going to see incredible backlash that happens. And you're going to see a OPEC countries forming an alliance that says we'll not sell to anybody who supports Israel. So America, if you want gasoline, you better, you better stop your support of Israel. Israel will become a, a difficult thing, and Jerusalem will become a couple trembling. It is going to happen. And it's going to happen not years from now. Sooner than that. And everything is going to begin to change. You see, we're kind of in a time, we kind of recognize troubles at hand, but at the same time, we still have plenty. 
Joseph, what was it like in Egypt when Joseph said, hey, let's start storing up food for seven years? And everybody goes, why store wheat, man? We got plenty of wheat. We don't need to store wheat. We got plenty of wheat. Same principle is true with Noah. Why, why are you talking about rain? There's no rain. It dews. It dews. The ground gets wet. What do you mean rain from the sky? Why build something that you don't need? Well, that's because you don't need it till you need it. Why straw wheat when you don't need to? Because you don't need it till you need it. We're at a place like that today. We're going to see the dollar collapse. We're going to see a new uh, American currency. We're going to see a new global currency. We're going to see a new one world currency. We're going to see a new one world order. We're going to see... We're going to see a whole different economic structure set up between Mexico, Canada, and the United States. We're going to see a whole new structure set up with the European economic community. We're going to see a whole, a whole new thing that's going to be going. The United Nations is going to get stronger. The EU is going to be getting stronger. We're going to see Turkey rise out of seemingly out of the ashes and become an incredible force in the Middle East with, with darkness in the core of it. Right now, Turkey seems to be rather demure, but Turkey will not remain demure for long. They've already started raising their head. The Lord told me about that. And you're going to start seeing Russia take on a whole new nationalism, and Russia is going to create a crisis in order to, to spawn nationalism because it realizes it's, using, it's losing its youth. And so Putin coming back in is part of the whole thing that the Lord talked to me about where Putin and Medvedev would begin to clash. Putin would end up taking over, but there's a third guy behind the scene that is even more ruthless than that. And he will end up showing up on the scene. He's not on the scene yet, but he will be on the scene. And Putin is setting the stage for his coming. He is not the Antichrist because the Antichrist comes from somewhere else. But it is part of the whole end time scenario and it is part of what, what Russia is doing and Russia is going to end up blackmailing many of the small satellite nations that used to be part of the Soviet bloc and demanding that they come into a whole new alliance and a whole new agreement and Poland will be blackmailed. I hope they do not succumb. I've got to give a message to them in the spring uh, when I go there. Uh, uh, Czechoslovakia, the Slavic countries, uh, Hungary, Romania, Ukraine, all uh, Kakistan, all these are going to be blackmailed by Russia. Says if you want our oil and you want our gas, you will come back in. Because if you don't, we will close the pipeline tomorrow. And they're waiting for the price of gas to get up high enough so they can close the pipeline to those countries and still be able to function economically in their own state. But they have to wait till the price of gasoline gets up high before they can cut the pipeline off. This is what the Lord showed me. I mean, I was going into these details with me, and I'm going, Lord, I don't think I can retain all of this. He says, yes, you can. Here, he told me about, he said, the earthquakes are going to be coming. Earthquakes are going to change the tilt of the earth. And so we had the Chile earthquake, and the earth tilted the tilt changed. We have the New Zealand earthquakes and the earth's tilt changed. We have the, the Japan earthquake and the tilt of the earth changed. And he says, when you start to see this happening, when the tilt of the earth changes, jet streams are going to change. Weather patterns are going to change dramatically. And countries are going to experience climatological changes that they've never experienced before. And it will cause the loss of crops. Whether it be fruit crop or wheat crop, grain crops, Vegetable crops, you're going to see the loss of crops because jet streams are going to change because the tilt of the earth changed. Just one degree change, a half a degree change, can mean hundreds of miles in the change of a jet stream. And it says that when this begins to happen, cracks are going to be for begin to form in the shields of the earth. And when that happens, the sun is going to begin to rise up again. It's going to awaken, and there will be... There will be uh, uh, he, he didn't say CME as I just discovered what coronal mass ejection, what that type of stuff is. But he just said eruptions from the sun are going to come and the energy from the sun is going to seep through the cracks and it's going to, the day will come when you're, it will wipe out many of your satellites. When that happens, no cell phones, no ATMs, no bank transfers, no TV that, when that happens. And the day will come. In fact, there will be airplanes in the sky that can't land 
and they have to figure out how they're going to land because they have no satellite guidance system. It's all going to be visual. This type of thing is, we are going to face this type of thing if we do not cry out to God. The moment we cry out to God, He will stop the process if it's a sustained cry. But the problem is if we don't cry out, these, this is what is coming our way. It is headed our way. There's so much that is, go that is about to take place in this nation. There's so many things. There's other assassination attempts that are going to be coming. I'm not, I'm, I, you know, I'm not a part of any of that. I just know what God has shown me. There's anger that is going to be erupting. Violence is going to be in the streets. Rich houses are going to be, uh, neighborhoods are going to be invaded. If what the Robin Hood mentality of what's yours is mine is going to, is going to spread. And, and all you're going to be seeing in multi-million dollar neighborhoods is chimneys left standing and burnt chars of the houses. Violence is going to become so, so prevalent, the police forces will not be able to take care of it, and even the military forces will only be able to take care of it in the urban areas and not the rural areas, and even all urban areas won't be able to be taken care of. It will be so widespread. Our military will be, will, will be coming home, the Lord said. Finance is going to force you to shrink the size of the military. It will end up causing cracks to form in the military and end up allowing your country to be invaded if you do not turn your heart to me. And so as I'm starting to read, I'm starting to read about the shrinking of the military. I'm starting to read about the numbers of, uh, they're no longer going to have, they're cutting X number of tens of thousands of, of military positions. I'm starting to reading about what they're doing. I'm going, oh my goodness, it's happening, it's happening. Has there been military excess? Probably. I don't doubt that. But I also know this. This is what the Lord said. This is what's going to be happening. Your army is going to start shrinking. Your protection is going to start shrinking. Because you're going to think the pride of your heart is going to say we don't need it. It's happening. We're going to see... There are going to be tornadoes that end up coming because of the changes in the jet streams and the climatological changes. They're going to have to invent a higher category of, of, of a tornado. I think the highest it goes to right now is F5. I think it's going to have to go to an F6. Whatever the next category is that they don't have, that's what they're going to have to have because they have never measured wind speeds of tornadoes this high before. That's what's that's coming. Hurricanes that are over 500 miles wide are going to hit this nation. Volcanoes are going to erupt again in the northwestern part of the United States. Cities will be dramatically impacted. There will be, there will be things that happen in, uh, uh, that are just unheard of. The shape of the United States will change if we do not cry out to, the God, to God. See, here's why. You say, why does all this happen? It boils down to the Garden of Eden, and that is this. Whenever man fell away from God, he began to decay. Everything he touched began to decay. And the, and the world, Lord said it kind of like this, and it, the earth will no longer yield itself to you. To Cain, when he killed Abel, the earth will no longer yield itself to you. To the Israelites and, and Ezekiel, mountains, stop yielding your produce, your fruit to these people. Ezekiel 36 to 38, now mountains, hillsides, Valleys, start yielding your produce to the people, for their iniquity has been removed, and I will bring them back out of their captivity. God always, sin has always caused a disruption of that which God made to provide for us. But we don't, we don't understand the causality of sin, what it causes. We don't understand that things don't function like they're supposed to when we sin. We think there is no, we think that God is mocked, that there is no, no repercussion to sin. There is no consequence to sin. But there is. As David said, because a judgment is not carried out quickly, people think they got away with it. But it's the mercy of God that doesn't carry out the judgment quickly, hoping for repentance from you, but when it doesn't come, then there is a, 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 a build up, a bulge in the pipeline that suddenly bursts the pipeline and suddenly these things come upon us. 
What can we as a church do? What can we do? What are some of the things that we can we can do? And what are some of the things that still are going to be happening? And I'm, 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 there's many things happening in the world, but I'm going to be focused primarily here in the United States. Drought is going to continue to escalate in the lower half of the United States. So much so that just as it says in Revelation chapter 6, a loaf of bread, there may be bread, but what it's going to cost you will be enormous. So much so that they will have to put guards on trucks to keep trucks from being robbed for their food. Earthquakes will not only strike coastal areas, but even the Midwest of the United States. There will be places where hail falls, and it will be over a foot thick of hail. There will be softball sizes of hail with 24 inches of rain in 24 hours. There will be Tornadoes with such force that automobiles will become airborne missiles. The Lord told me that there would be a pandemic that, that, that came, but the first one would prove to be little but fear, but the second one that comes would be serious. So there's a pandemic that is going to be coming. There will be changes in our gravity as there's a shift happening. It will happen in the magma of the earth. Changes will happen in the gravity fields. Look for, look for notices, notifications of changes in the gravity fields. And also look for, with that will come uh, heating of the ocean's floor and the ocean's changing temperatures. And that will end up killing a lot of fish and everything else in the ocean. China's escalation is not by accident. It is planned and it is strategic and it has a design to be the lead power in the world. There's a commercial paper bubble that's about to burst in the commercial uh, markets, commercial real estate markets. There will be, he told me in, in 2007, there's going to be a move for people to start growing their own foods. And boy, has that happened. And by the way, if you're going to buy food, do not buy anything that is not, that has been genetically modified. It won't reproduce itself. And there's coming a blight in genetically modified crops that they think they're blight proof. They're not blight proof. When this thing hits, it will spread like wildfire. And so you'll see in, uh, nearly entire crops of like wheat or corn, some grain product will be one of the things that will be seen, but also in tomatoes. He said, you need to pray for President Obama's protection there's a plan to take his life. He said, whether you do agree or disagree with him is not the question, son. It is pray for his protection. I've commanded you to pray for his protection. The Bible, my word, commands you to pray for his protection. That all will be well with you. He said, the worst thing that could happen is for him to be taken out. I'm not talking about reelected or not reelected. I'm talking about, about taken out. The worst thing that could happen would be for him to be taken out. He showed me, I don't know what city, but I know it's a coastal city, and I know, and the result was from a dirty bomb. And a dirty bomb blew up in a, in a coastal city, and it was uninhabitable for uh, over 30 years. It was that level of radiation that was released. Oh, 
Oh, he told me, he said, if you have, he said, if you have the opportunity to buy rural land, take it, because it's going to become very valuable as people flee the cities. He said, this country is going to cut most of its foreign aid programs, and as a result, international dictators will multiply. He said, there's a growing anarchy that's going to come from the gay and lesbian community, and there will be reports of mobs maiming and torturing heterosexual men. And he said, there will, he said, there will come a time, he said, also watch for men, homosexual men, being able to carry a baby through organ transplant. So, transplanting of a uterus and the ability for a man because of technology the ability for a man to carry a baby he said many large churches are going to end up filing bankruptcy because they can't make the building payments. And that the, the church, he said, the church has taken on the, the concept that numbers means anointing. And so, so, and he said, and so they compromise my word so not to offend in order to keep the finances. Well, did I say that on TV or is this? Okay. Well, okay, what can you do? First, the church must learn how to contend for the faith again. We're weak and we fall away so easily when crisis hits. We've not been tested, and we have lost our resolve. And we understand little of the adversary's plans. We do not know how to, he said, the church has lost the ability to debate their faith without becoming angry. And thus we have so few strong, clear, godly voices in political arenas. We've lost our witness the witness that can fix others and strongly testifies that God is still God and will still do what he has always done. As a witness, we are to prove God exists. We have to return to the knowledge, to more than the knowledge of God, we have to return to a, a craving to know God. I mentioned that last night. That it's not just knowing about God. We have to return to a craving to know Him. That's intimacy with Him. The concept, Abraham knew Sarah and she conceived. That idea of, of close knowing of one another. Third, the church must return to the love of God's Word. And the belief that it is infallible and, and inerrant in its original form. This would include the conviction, understanding, and knowledge that God is absolute and there's only one way to know him and that's through Jesus. Yes. We need a new revelation of God's omniscience, omnipotence, om omnipresence, eternality, and immutability. That's why I talked about it last night. Because until we understand that, we will lose heart in the midst of a battle. But if we know our God is is Nothing can defeat him. Nothing is smarter than him. He, nothing knows more than him. No, until we know those things, our faith will weaken and we will tremble when, when signs in the heaven come. The Lord told Jeremiah, Do not be dismayed at the signs of the heaven that are coming, for the heathen or the Gentiles are afraid of them. Those who do not know me are afraid of them. So don't be dismayed. They are coming, and I'm telling you before they happen that they are coming. Don't be dismayed when they come 
because the, the, it's meant to cause the world to be in dismay, but you are not. And he said, here, he said, people, he said, my church, talking about the light earlier, Matt, he said this, he said, I've told my church, arise and shine for your light has come for the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. They grabbed that verse, arise and shine for your light has come. What they didn't grab is this, for behold, darkness shall cover the earth. Did not grab that. How does light come? Because darkness covers. And deep darkness will cover the people. You see, the earth responds to people. The earth responds to people. And that's why deep darkness will be on the people. And the earth's response is then to become dark. It is not the earth becomes grossly dark and then the people are dark. The people don't respond to what the earth does. The earth responds to what the people do. The earth is the response to, to us. That's what Paul was trying to tell the church in Rome, in Romans chapter 8, that the earth groans and is placed in a place of futility because it cannot do what it was created to do because sin, it is, has to respond to sin in mankind. And therefore, until we change our ways, the earth cannot yield like it is meant to yield to us. That's what Paul's saying in Romans 8. And that's what Isaiah is saying here, that darkness is going to cover the earth, but gross darkness is going to cover the people. But we've got to come back to a place where we, we cry out and we know our God. Turn to him with all of our hearts, with weepings and fasting. Crisis is the result of following the wrong God. Never has there been a crisis when men followed God. Because there's, if there's a crisis, there's always an answer to the crisis. I believe if you read Jeremiah 30, you'll find we're in a time like that. Don't have time to go over it, but it's Jacob's troubles. We are there. But here's what Psalm says for us. Psalms 24 regarding Jacob's troubles. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jake, Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek God's face. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up your everlasting doors and the king of glory shall come in. See, it is in Jacob's trouble that the king of glory will come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Selah. If we turn to seek the Lord, there's going to be a much clearer definition of Christian, which means much more persecution. It will not include the term lukewarm. Those who in this, those who seek the time, but who will ascend to the hill of the Lord in Jacob's trouble? Those who have a clean hands and a pure heart who are not vain, are puffed up in their thinking. You will live in the thick, holy presence of God. That means you will hear Him and be guided by Him. The gates of heaven will open to you. and Those spiritual questions that have been difficult to understand will now become easy to understand. The everlasting or ancient doors will open, meaning the ancient spiritual truths that have been hidden for a long time will be revealed. They're in the Bible, but because we're blind, we can't see what they mean. It's not like it's a new scripture. It's all right here, but we are blind. We have eyes that see, but see not, and have ears to hear, but to hear not. The might and strength and power of the Lord of hosts will come into your circumstances, into your situations, and he will fight, and they will fight on your behalf. And the Lord of glory will come into your house. Here's six, six things to keep your heart 
I have to, I have to tell you, I cannot watch TV very much. I can't watch news hardly at all anymore, even, even no matter what channel it is. And here's why. Even though the Lord has told me these things are coming, I watch TV and it creates fear in my heart. See, it, it, TV removes hope in God from me. I know things are coming, but I, I, I don't, I can't have something, something not good happens in my heart. Anxiety happens in my heart. If I watch too much news, if I watch too many, too many broadcasts, uh, anxiety, and I said, this is not the fruit of righteousness. Anxiety is not the fruit of righteousness. And Proverbs says that anxiety in the heart of a man produces depression. And I don't want to head that route. So I just say, Lord, this is all up to you. This is all up to you. It's, it's you, oh God. So here's, don't, number one, don't overreact to media hype and spin. Because a lot of what they say just isn't going to happen. And what is going to happen, they don't say. Strange how that works. Remember my message last night. He has been preparing you for this very hour. That's why I gave the message that I did last night. You were born for such a time as this. God knew when Jacob's trouble would come, and he said, I chose you to be there. What does that say about you? What does that say about you? That says God has so much confidence in you. He chose you. Looking ahead in time, he chose you to live right now. You have an ability to do something no one else in your bloodline had. A friend of mine. Bob Jones, he had this incredible vision. I'll never forget this. And it's, it means more to me now as, as we're marching down this road. He had this incredible vision where he's standing on top of a cliff and is looking down at the beach of an ocean. And he's, next to him is an angel standing with him. And, and he sees these men coming along the beach and, and walking on the sand. And they bend down at some point along the beach, each one of them. They bend down, they get down on their knees, they stick their hands in the sand, they feel around, and they bring their hands up, they look at their hands, and they're empty, and they walk off on down the sand. Another man comes, another man comes, another man. <coughs> Excuse me, more and more people come. None of them find anything. And the, and the Lord says, do you know who these are, Bob? And Bob goes, no, I, I don't know. And he said, these are the, the heroes of the faith. These are the Wesleys and the Whitworths and the, uh, the, Wiggle, the Whitfields and the Wigglesworths and the Edders and, and, the, and all these people throughout time. And each of them walk on the sands of time thinking they would find what, I, what you're about to find. And he goes, what? He says, Bob, go down there and walk on the sand. It's time for you to walk on the sands of time. And so Bob walk, goes down, he walks on the sand, and the angel says, says, now stop. Bob stops, says, now bend down, stick your hands in the sand as deep as you can, and pull out what you find. And Bob kneels down, puts his hand in the sand, feels this box, takes the sand off of it, pulls the box up, and he says, now open it. And when Bob opens it, there's these millions of little pieces of paper. And he says, Bob, do you know what these are? And he says, no. And he says, these are the names of those in my end time army. And he says, they're all alive right now. And he says, pull out that, pull out the top tray, pull out the tray. There's another, another layer. Pull out the, another tray. There's another layer. He said, these are the names of my end time scenes. And he says, Bob, I have saved the best of every generation till now. I've saved the best of every bloodline until now. I have planned these people. I have purposed these people. I have brought them into this time because I have put into them something no other generation has and no one in their bloodline has ever had. They had the ability for my kingdom. That's you. That's you. You are not here by accident. 
You were designed by the living God for this very hour to be a solution to somebody's problem in a time of need. So don't overact the media hype and spin. Simplify and streamline your life. Simplify and streamline your life. This is what does that mean? I can't buy an iPhone? No, buy an iPhone. Just understand it won't work a short time from now. But then no other phone will either, so don't worry. Reconnect with family and friends. Reconnect with family and friends. Relationship and friendship plays a dramatic role in helping each other, encouraging each other, sustaining each other, develop, reestablish friendships with family and friends. Remember, Proverbs 18.24 says, if you want to have friends, you have to show yourself friendly. The fourth thing you need to do, rethink your focus. Rethink your focus. Here's, here's what I tell people. I've tried to simplify it. I'm not a financial planner. I just do what God says and it works out. But that doesn't mean it will work out for you. But here's, here, so I said, Lord, everybody's emailing me and everybody's writing me saying, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Here's, here, here. I said, and I can't, I can't tell people in Seattle what to do and because it's not going to be the same as what people in New York need to do or what people in Miami need to do. I mean, you don't tell a person on the equator to buy a fur coat. I mean, it's just like. <laughs> but, but surely there is something that will work as an overall umbrella, as a guideline to thought processes. And, and he gave me this. He said, tell them these four things. Tell them to think in terms of real food. Tell them to think in terms of real need. Tell them to think in terms of real energy and tell them to think in terms of real food, real need, real energy, and uh, one more thing. Oh, real money. Real food, real need, real energy, real money. Think in those terms. Okay? Now, what do I mean real? I mean not something that is fad, not something that's unnecessary, not something that that you don't, that that... You have 40 of, so why buy a 41st one? Uh, so that's real, okay? So what is real food? Real food, no matter where you live, you're going to be subject to times where you're going to have a week or more where your refrigerator don't work. So here's a hint. Milk won't store long, okay? Number two, okay? So that's, so that's, that's what real means, okay? So real food. Real food. So uh, you say, well, canned food. Well, yes, be, be careful of the canned food that you get because, one, uh, obviously some of it has incredibly high sodium and you just die of sodium poisoning. The other is that, that some of it doesn't contain any nutrition. So, again, look at, look at that. Some does and some does not. So that's up to you. Be wise in how you do this. But, but real food, something that will last you longer than a week, I'd say at least two weeks, and some places in America will need, to have, will need to have food supplies that will last them far, far, far longer. But that's up to you and God. He knows where you live and he can tell you what to do. Okay, but think in terms of real food. In other words, things that can be sustained for a period of time without electricity. Number, okay, so real needs. What are real needs? Th I mean, there are real needs. Like, for example, feminine hygiene products. For you guys, deodorant. Now, you may not think that's a real need, but I'm telling you, if I'm near you, that's a real need for me. <laughs> Toothpaste. You know, just real needs. Think of, think of what your real needs. What is it that I need today that I literally, my life, now, I'm not th talking about anti-wrinkle cream. I'm talking, well, <laughs> will I be able to live if I don't have this? Okay, so now, and I'm not against anti-wrinkle cream. I'm just saying it's not a real need. Can you live without this? Yes. Okay. So real, real needs. Those are the type of things I'm talking about. And then uh, real energy. You have to really be able to think through this. If the electricity goes out because your power plants have been, have been hacked, 
There's, there's a, a virus introduced into the system, a cyber attack, and, uh, and many uh, of the fuel, many of the electrical grids go down, which is going to happen. You can't get, your ATM won't work. Your credit card will not work. And it will not work for like two weeks or longer. So you need to have at least two weeks of cash outside of the bank because, believe it or not, when that happens, they're going to close the bank. And when they lock the door, you can't get to your safety deposit box because guess where it's at? Inside the bank. So you can't get into the bank. So you need to be able to have at least two weeks worth of cash outside the bank. So real money. Now, some places, at, and, and if we don't repent, you're going to need more than cash. Because cash is going to be worthless. And when hyperinflation hits, it, 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 is going to be, it is going to be worthless. So you need more than, you need more than cash. You need, you need something more than that. But again, don't, yeah, bartering is not a bad idea. But don't, don't here's, here's my caution. Whatever you do, take possession. Because if you buy a gold futures contract, the paper will become worthless. If you buy gold and have somebody else store it for you, it will become worthless. Your paper will not get it. Why? Because there is only in existence, there's not enough gold to meet the gold that has been sold. In fact, in fact, 60% of the gold that is said it is owned, there's not enough gold to back up that. Take possession of whatever you, silver, gold, platinum, copper, whatever it is, you take possession, okay? And, I, and, 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 and God will give you all kinds of things. I mean, that's up to you and God. I'm not, like I said, I'm not a financial advisor or, nor a financial planner. I'm just telling you the thing. So, so you have um, real food, real need, um, you have real money, and real energy. Now, real energy. What is that? That basically says, if I need to go to work, how am I going to get there if the gas station isn't pumping gas? Because guess what? Electricity runs the pumps that fill your car with gas. And if the power grid's down, you won't have gas. So what are you going to do for that? There's one th And see, the, 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 the diversity makes it very hard. If you're living out on the rural land, like I live out on a, on a couple acres of land, I can, I can put a 50-gallon gas tank out there. But you can't do that in an apartment in Queens. See, so you've got to, you, you have to think through this whole process. What will you need where God has called you to live? Remember, he has chose the exact place for you to live. He's chosen that for you. So you're not like, well, God, why don't you put me here in the middle of New York? Well, that's because that's where you're going to have the greatest influence. Okay? So remember, those four, are, again, are real food, real need, real energy, and real money, okay? Now, that then, if you think through those and you listen to the Lord and you hear what he has to say, then the next thing is he wants you to become an influence. You're an influence. You're gonna be an influence to the people around you and in your culture. This is a time of innovation. This is gonna be a time of invention. For others, it will be a time of study and preparation for promotion that will come but for those who don't know God, it's going to be a time of anguish. They will be thinking about everything they lost. You see, heavenly thinking says, says God knew about this. He has a plan. I'm going to go to it. Earthly thinking says, I lost everything. And if, you, if your mind dwells on earthly thoughts, you will never achieve the new invention. You'll never have the new innovation. You'll never know what is going to be, what is going to be the needs of the people and be able to meet that need and therefore see the transfer of wealth into the hands of the godly. Don't chase trends, but study them. Don't chase them, but study them because you can take advantage of them. Needs are going to abound, so ask God for a solution to those needs and you'll succeed when your peers are failing. The final thing you can do is take more time to listen to God. 
Now, what does that mean? It does not mean, oh God, 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 oh God. Help me, help me, help me, help me. Please help me. Don't let them fire me. Don't let them fire me. Don't let them fire my neighbor, but especially don't let them fire me. Oh God, oh God, oh God. That's not listening. Develop a true dialogue. True dialogue is you speaking, God speaking. You speaking, God speaking. Take time to still your heart before the Lord. Peace is the potting soil for revelation. See, the Holy Spirit of peace, when He, he is the giver of all revelation. He seeks the deep things of God, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2. He seeks the deep things of God to reveal them to you. The very depths of God are probed by His Spirit, and He longs to reveal them to you. If He is the Holy Spirit of peace, then when He comes, He brings peace. And when He comes, in that peace is revelation. In that peace is innovation. In that peace is is everything you need to know for tomorrow to be the influence he has called you to be. This will be what sets you apart from your neighbors. Your peace, your love, your listening, your answers, your solution, when they don't have it. This is not a time to get dim. This is a time for great light. Again, why I spoke last night is you can radiate the light of God. You are the light of the world. It was not a metaphor that Jesus said. You see, here's, here, simply put, it's like this. <clears throat> God is light. That's what John said. James says he's the father of lights. John said God is light. When Nicodemus came to Jesus and he said to Jesus, you know, what, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, you must be born again. And Nicodemus says, hey, I, I, what do I do? Enter back into my mother? What are you talking about? Nicod and Jesus' response said, you're a leader in Israel and you don't understand this. Here's what that word born again literally means in the Greek. It literally means you must be procreated again. You must be procreated again. Now, what does that mean? It literally means the sperm of God has to come into you and ignite you. If the sperm of God comes in at salvation and ignites you and God is light, what is that sperm of God? You say, well, where do you get the sperm of God? I get it from John and Peter who said, Little children, do you not know that you are born of his incorruptible seed? That word seed is sperma. Sperma. The root that we get the word sperm from, if you didn't put that together. His sperm, light, comes into our darkness. We are transferred from the realm of darkness into the kingdom of his most marvelous light. And Jesus said, little children, the kingdom begins within you. We are children of light. We radiate light. I walk in the New Age settings. Now, I don't always speak in conferences. I go to New Age fairs and cause problems. I go to psychic fairs. I go to Renaissance fairs. I go to haunted happenings in Salem, Massachusetts. We have teams that go out to Burning Man on the high desert. We go to Hagen festivals. I mean, we go everywhere. Why? Because there are people who don't know Jesus there. And there are spiritual seekers there. And I walk into, I walk into some of these New Age fairs and I, and I walk in like what, one time we walked in and we did, a, we did a booth at the New Age fair and after it was all done, um, they said, I said to them, I said, can we come back next year? And she goes, well, I don't know. And I said, well, did we hurt anybody? Did we offend anybody? And it, she goes, oh, no, 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 no. Every, everybody thought you were really full of love. I said, oh, good, okay. Well, why, why can't we come back? And she said, well, I don't, I don't know how to tell you this. She said, so I'm just going to ask you right out. Are you a spiritual vampire? 
And I'm like, I'm going, what? I mean, my brain is like racing, spiritual vampire. What does that mean? What does, I said, I said, no, what do you mean? She said, why do you ask that? And she said, because, well, the only complaints we got was that whenever you came near their booth, they lost their ability to read. They couldn't do their readings. And they said, and they said, it's because of your strange aura. You see, we don't see auras like yours here very often. And you have this strange aura, and people lose their ability to do their reading, so they, they, they think you're a spiritual vampire. Are you? And I said, no, no. I said, no, no. Spiritual vampires, first of all, don't love. She goes, yeah, that's true. I said, but here's the deal. The, the, the rule, the spiritual law is this. Whenever a weaker spirit encounters a stronger spirit, they lose. She goes, that's what I told them. <laughs> now, why do I tell you that? Because you do not, when you're equipped in God and you know this God, this incredible God we serve, you do not get slimed when you walk in the darkness. They get enlightened. And and I understand that when you walk into darkness, I had this absolute faith in God and His greatness. That when I walk in the darkness, I carry His light. I was born of His sperma, which is light. It has entered into me. His kingdom has begun in me. It is growing and radiating from me. The stronger it gets, the less of me, the more of Him. Then I radiate out, and sooner or later, people are going to get touched a shadow length away from me. They're going to be healed when I don't even touch them. They're going to be changed when I walk near them. They are going to be different because I believe believe the word of God is true. His light has entered into me. I am a light in this world and you are the same. So, yes, darkness is coming on this nation and gross darkness is rising in the people, but you should arise and shine. Bless you.
I grew up in a super. Release. Now it's important.
Somehow we've, we have become, uh, we've, we've come to the place where that we expect uh, something for nothing. Whether it's gambling on the state lottery. See, part of the, part of the whole way of God is when you work, you multiply. And lottery systems aren't work. And that's, that's, the, that's the error of lottery. It's that there's no work involved in the multiplying. And that's why the fruit of the recipients, of whether it be a million dollars a year for life in publisher sweepstakes, or whether it be the lottery, or, or any number of things, 95% of all those people 10 years later are bankrupt and or dead. And so what we have to do is there's, there's massive, massive changes that have to take place. The problem is when you have politicians that are leading, whether it's Republican or Democrat, when you have a politician that's leading, politicians want to get reelected. And so they'll do what the people want versus what the country needs. And because, of, because they don't have that, that spiritual finance, that, I'm sorry, that spiritual backbone that says we have to do what's right. Because they come from a low spiritual water table. Then what happens is they make decisions that only prolong something till after their election process yeah. is over. And they retire. And we're seeing that all the time right now. Both, in both sides, both parties. We're seeing that all the time right now. It's so, it's so saddening to me because I realize that all it's doing is it's making things worse and that what the Lord showed me truly is going to, going to come to pass. And if we do not cry out to God, at some point our enemies will rule.